William Charles Westmoreland was a United States Army general, who most notably commanded U.S. forces during the Vietnam War from 1964 to 1968. From Westmoreland a Euro unregistered trademark S arrival in South Vietnam in January 1964, his brief was to achieve outright victory over the northern-backed Viet Cong, with minimal U.S. casualties, without provoking the Chinese by attacks on the north. Even some of his critics acknowledged that these demands were contradictory, and when casualties inevitably mounted, he was accused of pursuing a war of attrition. During his period of command, both the Battle of Eadrang and the Tet Offensive were technically U.S. victories, but enemy activity continued to escalate, while the Miley massacre caused outrage over the murder of innocent civilians. By the time he left to become Army Chief of Staff, U.S. manpower in Vietnam had reached a peak of 535,000. Westmoreland a Euro unregistered trademark S strategy, based on artillery and air power, was tactically successful but politically allowed the enemy to destroy the American public support for the war. Early life, William Westmoreland was born in Spartanburg County, South Carolina, to Eugenia Talley Childs and James Ripley Westmoreland. His upper-middle-class family was involved in the local banking and textile industries. At the age of 15, William became an Eagle Scout at Troop 1 Boy Scouts, and was recipient of the Distinguished Eagle Scout Award and Silver Buffalo from the Boy Scouts of America as a young adult. After spending a year at the Citadel in 1932 he was appointed to attend the United States Military Academy. His motive for entering West Point was to see the world. He was a member of a distinguished West Point class that also included Creighton Abrams and Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Westmoreland graduated as first captain a Euro the highest cadet rank a Euro, and received the Pershing Sword, which is presented to cadet with highest level of military proficiency. Westmoreland also served as the superintendent of the Protestant Sunday School Teachers. World War II, following graduation in 1936, he became an artillery officer and served in several different commands. In World War II he saw combat in Tunisia, Sicily, France and Germany. He reached a temporary wartime rank of colonel, and on October 13, 1944, was appointed the Chief of Staff of the 9th Infantry Division. Westmoreland established a balanced reputation as a stern taskmaster who cared about his men and took a great interest in their welfare. One called him the most caring officer, for soldiers, that I have ever known. After the war he completed a three-month management program at Harvard Business School. As Stanley Carno noted, Westy was a corporation executive in uniform. In 1962 Westmoreland was admitted as an honorary member of the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati. Vietnam. Equals background and overview equals. Master philosopher of war Carl von Clausewitz emphasized almost a century and a half earlier that because war is controlled by its political object, the value of this object must determine the sacrifices to be made for it both in magnitude and also in duration. He went on to say, once the expenditure of effort exceeds the value of the political object, the object must be renounced. The colonial struggle in Vietnam became part of the global Cold War in October 1949 when a victorious Chinese Communist army arrived on Vietnam's northern border and culminated in a decisive French defeat at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. China, the Soviet Union and other communist nations recognized the North while the United States and other non-communist states recognized the South as the legitimate government. By the time Westmoreland became army commander in South Vietnam, the option of a career-type settlement with a large demilitarized zone separating North and South, favored by military and diplomatic figures, had been rejected by the U.S. government, whose objectives were to achieve a decisive victory, and not to use vastly greater resources. The infiltration by regular North Vietnam forces into the South could not be dealt with by aggressive action against the Northern state because intervention by China was something the U.S. government was concerned to avoid but President Lyndon B. Johnson had given commitments to uphold South Vietnam against Communist North Vietnam. Chief of Staff of the United States Army, Harold Keith Johnson, and subsequently historians such as Harry G. Summers, Jr. came to see U.S. goals as having become mutually inconsistent, because defeating the Communists would require declaring a national emergency and fully mobilizing the resources of the U.S. J. 
General Johnson was critical of Westmoreland's diffused corporate style, considering him over-attentive to what government wanted to hear. Nonetheless, Westmoreland was operating within long-standing army protocols of subordinating the military to civilian policymakers. The most important constraint was staying on the strategic defensive out of fear of Chinese intervention, but at the same time President Lyndon B. Johnson had made it clear that there was a higher commitment to defending Vietnam. Much of the thinking about defense was by academics turned government advisors who concentrated on nuclear weapons, seen as making conventional war obsolete. The fashion for counterinsurgency thinking also denigrated the role of conventional warfare. Despite the inconclusive outcome of the Korean conflict, Americans expected their wars to end with the unconditional surrender of the enemy. The Gulf of Tonkin incident of August 2, 1964 led to a dramatic increase in direct American participation in the war, with nearly 200,000 troops deployed by the end of the year. Viet Cong and PAVN strategy, organization and structure meant Westmoreland faced a dual threat. Regular North Vietnamese army units infiltrating across the remote border were apparently concentrating to mount an offensive and Westmoreland considered this the danger that had to be tackled immediately. There was also entrenched guerrilla subversion throughout the heavily populated coastal regions by the Viet Cong. Consistent with the enthusiasm of Robert McNamara for statistics, Westmoreland placed emphasis on body count and cited the Battle of Eadrang as evidence the communists were losing. However, the government wished to win at low cost, and policymakers received McNamara's interpretation indicating huge American casualties in prospect, prompting a reassessment of what could be achieved. Moreover, the Battle of Eadrang was unusual in that U.S. troops brought a large enemy formation to battle. After talking to junior officers General Johnson became skeptical about localized concentrated search and destroy sweeps of short duration, because the communist forces controlled whether there were military engagements, giving an option to simply avoid battle with U.S. forces if the situation warranted it. The alternative of sustained countrywide pacification operations, which would require massive use of U.S. manpower, was never available to Westmoreland, because it was considered politically unacceptable. In public at least, he continued to be sanguine about the progress being made throughout his time in Vietnam, Though supportive journalist James Reston thought Westmoreland's characterizing of the conflict as attrition warfare presented his generalship in a misleading light. Westmoreland's critics say his successor, General Creighton Abrams, deliberately switched emphasis away from what Westmoreland dubbed attrition. Revisionists point to Abrams's first big operation being a tactical success that disrupted North Vietnamese build-up, but resulted in the Battle of Hamburger Hill a political disaster that effectively curtailed Abrams's freedom to continue with such operations. Equals Vietnam Commander Equals, in January 1964, he became Deputy Commander of Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara told President Lyndon B. Johnson in April that Westmoreland was the best we have, without question. As the head of the MACV he was known for highly publicized, positive assessments of U.S. military prospects in Vietnam. However, as time went on, the strengthening of communist combat forces in the South led to regular requests for increases in U.S. troop strength, from 16,000 when he arrived to its peak of 535,000 in 1968 when he was promoted to Army Chief of Staff. On April 28, 1967, Westmoreland addressed a joint session of Congress. In evaluating the enemy strategy, he said, it is evident to me that he believes our Achilles heel is our resolve. Your continued strong support is vital to the success of our mission. Backed at home by resolve, confidence, patience, determination, and continued support, we will prevail in Vietnam over the communist aggressor. Westmoreland claimed that under his leadership, United States forces won every battle. The turning point of the war was the 1968 Tet Offensive, in which communist forces attacked cities and towns throughout South Vietnam. At the time, Westmoreland was focused on the Battle of Khe San and considered the Tet Offensive to be a diversionary attack. It is not clear if Khe San was meant to be distraction for the Tet Offensive or vice versa. See the Riddle of Khe San. Regardless, 
U.S. and South Vietnamese troops successfully fought off the attacks during the Tet Offensive, and the Communist forces took heavy losses, but the ferocity of the assault shook public confidence in Westmoreland's previous assurances about the state of the war. Political debate and public opinion led the Johnson administration to limit further increases in U.S. troop numbers in Vietnam. Nine months afterward, when the Miley massacre report started to break, Westmoreland resisted pressure from the incoming Nixon administration for a cover-up, and pressed for a full and impartial investigation by Lieutenant General William R. Pierce. However, a few days after the tragedy, he had praised the same involved unit on the outstanding job, for the U.S. infantrymen had killed 128 communists, sig in a bloody day-long battle. Post-1969 Westmoreland also made efforts to investigate the Fong NHA and Fong NHANT massacre a year after the event occurred. Westmoreland was convinced that the Vietnamese communists could be destroyed by fighting a war of attrition that, theoretically, would render the Vietnam People's Army unable to fight. His war strategy was marked by heavy use of artillery and air power and repeated attempts to engage the communists in large unit battles and thereby exploit the U.S.'s vastly superior firepower and technology. However, the North Vietnamese Army and the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam were able to dictate the pace of attrition to fit their own goals, by continuing to fight a guerrilla war and avoiding large unit battles, they denied the Americans the chance to fight the kind of war they were best at, and they ensured that attrition would wear down the American public support for the war faster than they. Westmoreland repeatedly rebuffed or suppressed attempts by John Paul Van and Lou Wald to shift to a pacification strategy. Westmoreland had little appreciation of the patience of the American public for his time frame, and was struggling to persuade President Johnson to approve widening the war into Cambodia and Laos in order to interdict the Ho Chi Minh Trail. He was unable to use the absolutist stance, we can't win unless we expand the war, into Cambodia and Laos. Instead, he focused on positive indicators, which ultimately turned worthless when the Tet Offensive occurred, since all his pronouncements of positive indicators didn't hint at the possibility of such a last gasp dramatic event. Tet outmaneuvered all of Westmoreland's pronouncements on positive indicators in the minds of the American public. Although the Communists were severely depleted by the heavy fighting at Kisan when their conventional assaults were battered by American firepower, as well as tens of thousands of deaths in the Tet Offensive, American political opinion and the panic engendered by the Communist surprise sapped U.S. support for the war, even though the events of early 1968 put the United States and South Vietnam into a much stronger military position. Equals post Vietnam equals, Westmoreland was replaced by General Creighton Abrams in June 1968, the decision being announced shortly after the Tet Offensive. Although the decision had been made in late 1967, it was widely seen in the media as a punishment for being caught off guard by the communist assault. Westmoreland served as Chief of Staff of the United States Army from 1968 to 1972. In 1970, as Chief of Staff, in response to the Miley massacre by U.S. Army forces, he commissioned an army investigation that compiled a comprehensive and seminal study of leadership within the army during the Vietnam War demonstrating a severe erosion of adherence to the army's officer code of duty, honor, country. The report, entitled Study on Military Professionalism, had a profound influence on army policies, beginning with Westmoreland's decision to end the policy that officers serving in Vietnam would be rotated into a different post after only six months. However, to lessen the impact of this damaging report, Westmoreland ordered that the document be kept on close hold across the entire army for a period of two years and not disseminated to war college attendees. The report only became known to the public after Westmoreland retired in 1972. Many military historians have pointed out that Westmoreland became chief of staff at the worst time in history with regard to the army. Guiding the army as it transitioned to an all-volunteer force, he issued many directives to try to make army life better and more palatable for United States U. The Euro for example, allowing soldiers to wear sideburns and to drink beer in the mess hall. However, many hardliners scorned these as too liberal. Westmoreland ran unsuccessfully for governor of South Carolina in 1974. He published his autobiography the following year. 
Westmoreland later served on a task force to improve educational standards in the state of South Carolina. He was mentioned in a Time magazine article as a potential candidate for the 1968 Republican nomination. In 1986, Westmoreland served as Grand Marshal of the Chicago Vietnam Veterans Parade. The parade, attended by 200,000 Vietnam veterans and more than half a million spectators, did much to repair the rift between Vietnam veterans and the American public. Westmoreland vs. CBS, The Uncounted Enemy Mike Wallace interviewed Westmoreland for the CBS special The Uncounted Enemy, A Vietnam Deception. The documentary, shown on January 23, 1982, and prepared largely by CBS producer George Kral III, alleged that Westmoreland and others had deliberately underestimated Viet Cong troop strength during 1967 in order to maintain U.S. troop morale and domestic support for the war. Westmoreland filed a lawsuit against CBS. In Westmoreland v. CBS, Westmoreland sued Wallace and CBS for libel, and a lengthy legal process began. While the trial was in progress, Westmoreland suddenly settled with CBS for an apology, no more than CBS had originally offered. Some contend that Judge Level's instructions to the jury over what constituted actual malice to prove libel convinced Westmoreland's lawyers that he was certain to lose. Others point out that the settlement occurred after two of Westmoreland's former intelligence officers, Major General Joseph McChristian and Colonel Gaines Hawkins, testified to the accuracy of the substantive allegations of the broadcast, which were that Westmoreland ordered changes in intelligence reports on Viet Cong troop strengths for political reasons. Disagreements persist about the appropriateness of some of the methods of CBS's editors. A deposition by McChristian indicates that his organization developed improved intelligence on the number of irregular Viet Cong combatants shortly before he left Vietnam on a regularly scheduled rotation. The numbers troubled Westmoreland, who feared that the press would not understand them. He did not order them changed, but instead did not include the information in reporting to Washington, which in his view was a decision that the data was not appropriate to report. Based on later analysis of the information from all sides, it appears clear that Westmoreland could not sustain a libel suit because CBS's principal allegation was that he had caused intelligence officers to suppress facts. Westmoreland's anger was caused by the implication of the broadcast that his intent was fraudulent and that he ordered others to lie. During the acrimonious trial, Mike Wallace was hospitalized for depression, and despite the legal conflict separating the two, Westmoreland and his wife sent him flowers. Wallace's memoir is generally sympathetic to Westmoreland, although he makes it clear he disagreed with him on issues surrounding the Vietnam War and the Nixon administration's policies in Southeast Asia. Views In a 1998 interview for George magazine, Westmoreland criticized the battlefield prowess of his direct opponent, North Vietnamese General Von Nguyen Giap. Of course, he Jaip was a formidable adversary, Westmoreland told correspondent W. Thomas Smith, Jr. Let me also say that Jaip was trained in small unit, guerrilla tactics, but he persisted in waging a big unit war with terrible losses to his own men. By his own admission, by early 1969, I think, he had lost, what, a half million soldiers. He reported this. Now such a disregard for human life may make a formidable adversary, but it does not make a military genius. An American commander losing men like that would hardly have lasted more than a few weeks. In the 1974 film Hearts and Minds, Westmoreland opined that the Oriental doesn't put the same high price on life as does a Westerner. We value life and human dignity. They don't care about life and human dignity. Westmoreland's view has been heavily criticized by Nick Terse, the author of the book Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam. Terse said that many of the Vietnamese killed were actually innocent civilians, and the Vietnamese casualties were not just caused by military crossfire but were a direct result of the U.S. policy and tactics, for example the policy Kill Everything That Moves, which enabled the U.S. soldiers to shoot civilians who had suspicious behavior. He concluded that, after having spoken to survivors of massacres by United States forces at Phi Phu, Tri Y, My Liwok and so many other hamlets, I can say with certainty that Westmoreland's assessment was false. 
He also accused Westmoreland of concealing evidence of atrocities from the American public when he was the Army Chief of Staff. In more than a decade of analyzing long classified military criminal investigation files, court martial transcripts, congressional studies, contemporaneous journalism, and the testimony of United States soldiers and Vietnamese civilians, I found that General William C. Westmoreland, his subordinates, superiors and successors also engaged in a profligate disregard for human life. Historian Derek Frisbee also criticized Westmoreland's view during an interview with Deutsche Well. General William Westmoreland, who commanded U.S. military operations in the Vietnam War, unhesitatingly believed Jayap was a butcher for relentlessly sacrificing his soldiers in unwinnable battles. Yet, that assessment in itself is key to understanding the West's failure to defeat him. Jayap understood that protracted warfare would cost many lives but that did not always translate into winning or losing the war. In the final analysis, Jayap won the war despite losing many battles, and as long as the army survived to fight another day, the idea of Vietnam lived in the hearts of the people who would support it, and that is the essence of revolutionary war. For the remainder of his life, Westmoreland maintained that the United States did not lose the war in Vietnam. He stated instead that our country did not fulfill its commitment to South Vietnam. By virtue of Vietnam, the U.S. held the line for ten years and stopped the dominoes from falling. Personal life Westmoreland initially met his future wife, Catherine Stevens Van Dusen, while stationed at Fort Sill. She was nine years old at the time and was the daughter of the post executive officer, Colonel Edwin Van Dusen. Westmoreland met her again in North Carolina when she was 19 and a student at UNC Greensboro. The couple married in May 1947 and later had three children a daughter, Catherine Stevens, a son, James Ripley II and another daughter, Margaret Childs. Just hours after Westmoreland was sworn in as Army Chief of Staff on July 7, 1968, his brother-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel Frederick Van Dusen, was killed when his helicopter was shot down in the Mekong Delta region of Vietnam. Westmoreland died on July 18, 2005, at the age of 91 at the Bishop Gadsden Retirement Home in Charleston, South Carolina. He had suffered from Alzheimer's disease during the final years of his life. He was buried on July 23, 2005, at the West Point Cemetery, United States Military Academy. The General William C. Westmoreland Bridge in Charleston, South Carolina, is named in his honor. In 1996, the National Society of the Sons of the American Revolution authorized the General William C. Westmoreland Award. The award is given each year in recognition to an outstanding SAR veterans volunteer. Dates and rank, United States Military Academy Class of 1936. Retired from active service in July 1972. Awards and Decorations, General Westmoreland's Military Awards, U.S. Military Decorations and Awards, Foreign Decorations and Awards, Badges, Tabs, and Patches, Combat Infantryman Badge, Army Aviator Badge, Master Parachutist Badge, Glider Badge, Army Staff Identification Badge, Republic of Vietnam Parachutist Badge, Other Honors, Knox Trophy Award, USMA Highest Military Efficiency as a Cadet at West Point, 1936. See also List of Korean War Veterans who are recipients of the Bronze Star. Notes. References. Kano, Stanley, Vietnam. A History, New York, New York, USA, Penguin, ISBN 978-0140265477. Mascaro, Tom, The Uncounted Enemy, A Vietnam Deception, Chicago, Illinois, USA, The Museum of Broadcast Communications. Smith, W. Thomas, J.R., An Old Soldier Sounds Off, George. Wallace, Mike. Gates, Gary Paul. Between You and Me, New York, New York, USA, Hyperion, ISBN 978-1401383565. Westmoreland, William C., A Soldier Reports, Garden City, New York, USA, Doubleday, ISBN 978-0385004343. External links, General.
Westmoreland's Political Donations, an article on the CBS documentary Controversy by LTC Evan Parrott for the Air War College, PDF copies of M. G. MacChristian's deposition for the CBS trial, M. G. MacChristian's deposition concerning his participation in the documentary and clarifying his observation of the facts, analysis of the broadcast by Professor Peter Rollins of Oklahoma State University, hosted on Vietnam Veterans website. William C. Westmoreland Collection U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, Calal, Pennsylvania, 1981 Video Interview with Westmoreland about U.S. military involvement in Vietnam, Obituaries, Initial Report on the Death of Westmoreland from the Associated Press, Obituary, General Commanded Troops in Vietnam from the Washington Post, General Westmoreland, who led U.S. in Vietnam, dies from the New York Times, Commander of U.S. Forces in Vietnam dies aged 91 from the Times, a general who fought to win from the state, Westy recalled as noble, tragic from the state, farewell salute to a fine soldier from the Washington Times, General Westmoreland's death wish in the war in Iraq from CommonDreams.org.